Good morning, everyone, and welcome to this webinar, which is entitled Raid on Air Pollution, Communication and Protective Behavior. This webinar is co-organized by the European Radon Association, the International Atomic Energy Agency, the Horizon 2020 Radonon Project and the SHARE platform. The aim of this webinar is to draw additional insight from a, a variety of top experts on risk communication in order to help practitioners responsible for radon communication strategies to develop an evidence-based, theory-based and strategic communication according to the new European Basic Safety Standard Directive. My name is Clara Himmelbauer and I will be moderating today's webinar. I'm working at the Austrian Agency for Health and Food Safety in the Department of Radiation Protection, which also holds the Austrian National Radon Center. I'm also a member of the European Radon Association. The webinar today will have the following structure. Each of the speakers will have eight minutes to present their insights on the topic we ask them to cover. And in the end, we will have an open discussion with all our panelists. So if you have any questions during the webinar, um, you can use the chat function, which is available at the bottom line of Zoom. But please make sure that you select the option to panelists and attendees so that all participants can actually see your question. Ms. Fediana Hotti will be following the chat and she will aggregate and summarize the questions which our speakers will address. The webinar will also be recorded together with your questions. So you will be able to find the records at the SHARE website. With us today is also a member of the executive board and the former president of the European Radon Association, Professor James McLaughlin, who will give final remarks on our webinar. So the webinar will be finished by 11.30. Uh, by now we have around 150 participants from all around the world registered. Thank you very much for joining this webinar. Before we start now, I would like to ask, to ask all the speakers to shortly introduce themselves, focusing on their backgrounds and most important experiences. Okay, uh, we can start with Dr. Laura Mesquita. Can you please shortly introduce yourself? Good morning, I'm Laura. I'm a medical oncologist uh, working in the medical oncology department at Hospital Clinic in Barcelona, in Spain. I'm a member of the EORDC Lung Cancer Group, an academic association of clinical research for cancer patients in Europe and co-investigator of the BioRadon study in the Radon Arm Project. Thank you. Thank you, Laura. Um, Professor Frederic Boudet, you may continue, please. Yes, uh, uh, good morning. Uh, I'm Frederick Boudet. I am based at the University of Stavanger in Norway. I have about 70 years of uh, expertise in uh, risk communication and I have a, a real interest in uh, linking risk communication, perception and communication uh, that comes mainly from cognitive science to uh, policy and action. Thank you. Uh, we may continue with you, Dr. Olga Germann. Good time of the day, everyone. My name is Olga German. I work at the Radiation Protection Unit in the International Atomic Energy Agency, and I'm responsible for our radon program, among my other responsibilities. Thank you. Dr. Tanya Perko, can you please introduce yourself? Thank you, Clara. I'm uh, Tanya Perko from Belgium Nuclear Research Center and University of Antwerp. Uh, my uh, background is risk communication and also risk perception. I'm also work package leader in the new Radonorm project uh, where we integrated social sciences to the greatest level and we hope that we will uh, present some of the, our uh, uh, future research uh, attention uh, in this webinar. Thank you. Thank you. Our last speaker of today's webinar is Professor Heidi van der Bosch. Can you please introduce yourself? Heidi, we cannot hear you. Please unmute your microphone. I'm sorry. My name is Heidi van der Bosch. I work at the Department of Communication Sciences at the University of Antwerp. 
I'm not a Raiden communication specialist, but I do have a background in health communication. So I will talk from a more general perspective uh, today, and I hope this will also inspire future Raiden communication. Thank you very much. Um, now we will hear the reflection of topics from our panelists. We can start with Laura Mesquita. Laura, you are working as a medical oncologist and treating lung cancer patients, and you are also researching on radon-induced lung tumors, as radon-induced tumors. Based on your experience, can you tell us about the role of radon communication for your patients? Are they aware of the health risks of radon? So firstly, I would like to thank the scientific committee for the invitation to this webinar. It's a pleasure uh, to be here. And so my, my medical oncologist working in thoracic oncology for more than nine years now, and my daily practice mainly consists of on treating patients with lung cancer. That is the leading cause of cancer death. And with no standardized screening measures, most of our patients that we see in consultation are in advanced disease when lung cancer cannot be curable. So really, even for us, lung cancer prevention must be a priority. In our medical environment, everyone recognizes smoking as leading cause of, of lung cancer. However, radon remains an, a still, uh, a still an, a silent risk factor and who there are doctors that know radon, but these are mainly as an occupational risk factor for minors and not as lung cancer cause uh, in the general population. So during these years that I've been working in clinics and also in radon research, I've, I've noted that um, there is a lack of information about radon risk in our medical environment. So probably because we did not receive any training about indoor radon, during the medical school or, or even during our continuous medical training. So, but in my personal case, I learned about Graydon earlier, thanks to one of my first patients in my first year as medical oncologist. So she was a really kind patient in her forties, never a smoker, diagnosed with a lung adenocarcinoma and a stage four with bone metastasis. I, I still remember when she came to my consultation and told me, Laura, my cancer is for radon. So it's, she lived in a radon prone area and she um, studied by herself about radon and she tested radon in her home and then came to me with an amount of information about radon that initially I didn't know how to, to handle. So, after that, and thanks to her, I start gaining interest on radon and lung cancer until the point that I finally, uh, I did my PhD on, on radon. She opened my mind and I'm really grateful for, for that. And since then I integrated the radon communication, the risk communication about as, as part of my clinical practice. Unfortunately, she passed away uh, two, two years ago. And, um, but even though she, uh, we could transmit to her the preliminary step of all the research that we are currently doing. However, for the majority of the patient, this is not the case. Radon is completely unknown. So for our patients have uh, usually have never uh, been asked for radon exposure before our consultation. So for example, the typical case of a patient non-smoker that didn't understand why he had or she had a lung cancer, that is around 15% of the patient that we see in consultation. So the, the first reaction that we see is to have in front of us a patient that say, what? And, and, and start asking us, what a radioactive gas? What? How can this be possible in my house? But my house, my house is safe. And should I move? No, this is the typical question. And, and this is quite common in, in our consultation. So I recently see in consultation one patient for the first time. So she was a 69, she is a 69 years old patient, also never a smoker as the first patient, and diagnosed between last year and this year of three different lung cancer. 
So the first two cancers were localized and treated with surgery. But unfortunately, the, the last one in this July was diagnosed in advanced disease with brain metastases that are really common in lung cancer with advanced disease. So as we, as we normally do, we ask her where she lived and where she uh, worked. In this case, she was a housewife um, and she had been living in a bedroom front area all her life and interestingly, she was living before she was, until she was 20, in a cave house. So the cave house excavated in the mountain are really typical in the south of Spain. So probably uh, here she was exposed also a high rate of concentration. So taking this as an example of what we normally do in a consultation when we talk about radon, uh, first we inform, so what is radon? Where does the radon come from? And then we talk about the risk of lung cancer associated with high radon levels or prolonged uh, radon exposure. And also include some information about prevention. Because when we talk about this, the patient usually are impact. So when patient knew, then know that radon is natural radiation, it's everywhere. And there are ways, there are strategies to prevent the exposure the patients are a little bit more relieved. But even that usually ask for more information. So we refer to the different uh, national organisms, so, uh, the national, um, the nuclear uh, safety council in Spain. Now, when, when we work in, in France, the nuclear security and radio protection agency. So um, the second point important is we recommend to test radon in their home. In this case, we could not test in the previous home because it was uh, uh, sold, the cave house. But in this case, we will measure in the radon inside the uh, bioradon study that will assess in Europe in 1,300 patients the indoor radon concentration to identify the type of lung cancer that is associated with this radon. And uh, as third point, we usually, in case of high radon levels, to take action. We uh, try to provide information to the patient to help the, pa the patient to, to, um, to know how to decrease the, the radon levels in home and, uh, this is a, and, and how to, to be referred to different agency or organisms specialized. And it's, it's quite complicated to deal with this conversation, with this, with this discussion with the patient. And um, it's, an, it's a sensitive uh, issue because there are two points. No? On one side, there is the, the perception of risk in a patient with already a lung cancer. So it's difficult to transmit this. And then how this risk can impact in the, in the patient's families, uh, particularly difficult when we discuss about their children. So there is, in, in my experience as, as clinician, I believe there is a, a, a need, a major need for radon communication in the medical environment. And for us, the oncologists, we need a specific training to help to, to improve our doctor-patient conversation, discussion about radon, but also increase the awareness about cancer prevention related to radon, as we already do with other risk factors, but not yet for radon. And this is a key point for us in BioRadon. For example, we will um, we, we have planned educational program, an educational program specific training for all the lung cancer specialists that usually don't know anything about radon to know how, and then we'll participate as investigators in BioRadon, the how to um, deal with this and how to communicate the risk information about radon with the patient and the families and in the same thing so in this case my case as medical oncologist with professor best that is the other co-investigator of bio radon are isolated cases in the overall situation of of oncologists in europe so the first point for the radon communication is to reach the medical doctors and also the patient because in oncology, for example, the message, the strongest message is that one that comes from the patient. So Bioradon has been endorsed by the Patients, Lung Cancer Patients Association 
and also um, cancer groups advocate. And uh, it's really nice because we are working together to promote the participation of the patients and to promote research in their own diseases. And then um, we can um, uh, and then provide information for the patient and also the families. So there are also educational tools that are planned for all the patients participating in BioRhythm. So there is a lot of work to do working together and I need your support in this as a specialist and the EORTC Lung Cancer Group will be happy to work with all of you and thank you very much for your attention. Thank you very much, Laura, for sharing this important story. Um, our next speaker is Frederic Bruder. He is a recognized expert in risk communication and risk analysis. Frederic, you are also the first author of the Potsdam Communication Manifesto. In this manifesto, the European leading experts appeal for a better radon communication. Can you please introduce to us what this means? Yes, uh, so uh, hello everybody. Um, today I will, um, okay, of course, okay, it's a bit slow when it's shared. I hope you all see. So uh, today, today's talk uh, will focus, first of all, I'd like to try uh, to start with some uh, form of uh, uh, challenging environment, which is that a lot of money has been wasted on what I would say untested communications, communications that do not take on board what we know from the science. And we've seen that in many areas, uh, acrylamide in Sweden, about uh, you know uh, food scare, where wrong kind of information was frightening people about all getting cancers from their crisps in a way uh, to uh, vaccine uh, scares uh, you know can I get uh, autism from the MMR measles mumps rubella vaccine uh, to uh, actually in these days COVID-19 we see a lot of information that is going in all directions and uh, it's a very uh, challenging environment so what we can what can we do uh, in, when we deal with risk communication, I think we need to get back to the science. So there has been a large uh, field of studies that started essentially in the, back in the 60s on uh, risk communication coming from risk perception studies. And this is very much in this context that uh, I will present uh, a science-informed uh, set of suggestions to build more effective communications. These suggestions are embedded in the so-called Potsdam Raiden uh, communication manifesto. Back in the days where we could meet face to face in places, we uh, had a lovely meeting uh, about a year ago, a bit less, uh, at Potsdam at the Institute for Advanced Sustainability Study. And out of this very creative two days where we had you know, researchers meeting with policymakers, uh, Tanya Peko was there, um, we uh, drafted a, a manifesto which tries to link the science to action. So I will go through the main points of the manifesto. First, what we suggest is to reframe Raiden as indoor air pollution. And I think actually in that respect, Laura's points were very interesting um, in terms of how that could be practically applied. Uh, it is not just about you know a natural radioactive gas that we find and that could frighten people if you if you speak about it that way, but say, okay, we need to deal with what pollution can be in your home. People care about living in a safe environment and need to be made aware that their homes are not entirely safe. This shouldn't come as a shock. It should be done in a sensitive way and we can link it to other pollutants, uh, the cancer strategies, anti-tobacco, sustainability, energy savings, etc. It should be part of the wider awareness about, you know, having a safer home. A second aspect that will be very important for moving into communicating um, Raiden more in a more science-based uh, fashion is that leadership and engagement needs to be there. Government must take a more active role. You shouldn't wait for just third parties to raise the issues. This can be achieved through joint action plans, for instance. Policymakers should also directly engage with Raiden experts, with uh, academia, with other researchers. 
They should also refrain from outsourcing that communication to PR agencies. We've seen actually a lot of communication that have failed in various areas because governments don't look really at the communication. They just say, okay, let's hire PR consultants. They're just going to deal with it. And then it's shifted to uh, somebody else. Uh, and the result can be actually quite bad. Uh, inclusive, coherent, and consistent communications are very important. And that's something we see again and again in risk communications, where we have, you know, for example, different people in different agencies speaking about different things um, and giving mixed messages, and people don't know what they should believe. And again, the COVID-19 uh, environment uh, offers a lot of examples of that. We need to include a range of radiant stakeholders and civil society representatives, inform people at risk, liaise between policy areas, you know, labor, health, etc., liaise across levels of government, central government, uh, local government communes, agree also on what constitutes a level that may be negligible or tolerable or unacceptable. Um, you know, is it 100 becquerels, is it 300 becquerels? Cut-off uh, type of uh, threshold can be very uh, misleading, especially if they are different in different regions, for instance, of, uh, as we discussed. Sustain communication of the time is also very important. Important. Make lasting impact communication. Um, you know, have yearly events that go beyond just the one day, like the European Raiden Day. It's, it's good, but it's not enough to, have, to speak about Raiden and then forget about it for the rest of the year. So we need to engage with key players. And again, link with the indoor quality community air quality community. Uh, we need to have communication campaign that are systematically measured and the lessons must be shared. Interactive tools can be very helpful. People are drawn to maps, for example. They love maps. And that, that was something that was clearly discussed uh, uh, among us. But the maps to be useful need to be truly interactive. They need to be accurate. They need to help to support decisions. And visual tools can be envisaged, such as app, for instance. We need training programs, training to engage with interested party at a deeper level. Again, it's not just about the one event once in a while. It's having a sustainable uh, commitment uh, to training. Uh, and then the people who are trainer trained can become what we would call ambassadors or multipliers. They will understand, for instance, that it's better to speak about radon as indoor pollution. And, and there are ways to communicate about uh, risks. We need a specific focus on the building and construction industry because they are the ones who will then have to comply with norms and have to, some time to communicate with public. Science labs, summer schools can be good vehicles. Basic risk communication in the curricula of the Raiden experts could really make a difference. Support social science research, of course, I would say that because that's it's always good to have support. Uh, I think it's really important, however, to uh, go beyond, you know, uh, just gut feelings about how to communicate. Uh, we need to, again, go back to what the science says. And the science is evolving. So that needs to be uh, something that is sustained over time. So I think I'm about the time I was supposed to, sp to spend. That's an overview of our manifesto. And I'm looking forward to discussing further with people. Thank you. Thank you, Frederick, for presenting the findings of this manifesto. Um, so you say that there's a need for empirical proven theory-based and strategic risk communication. With this, we come now to a more practice oriented presentation. And our next speaker is Olga German from the International Atomic Energy Agency. Olga, can you please introduce to us what are the main activities of the IAEA in order to support European countries with programs and tools for radon communication? Yes, if Frederick would please stop sharing his screen. Thanks. Thank you, Clara. Uh, my, now my picture. Hmm. Doesn't want to share. Could you share my presentation? It, my, system does not want to share. Yes. Oh, okay, now it works. Uh, 
So hello everyone again and um, as International Atomic Energy Agency we have responsibility to um, to communicate accurately on the scientific scientifically based uh, information be clear in communication we of course need to earn some credibility and we have to be trusted by all our stakeholders to which to whom we communicate um, Clara mentioned that we have radon activities in Europe first of all we have radon uh, related activities in all uh, world of the world of course and our definition of Europe is somewhat different compared to European Union so it's everything from Portugal until um, Tajikistan, Kyrgyzstan, Uzbekistan etc. So a little bit broader communication in Europe. We, our main stakeholders are governmental uh, also and regulatory bodies representatives. We have registrants, licensees, and just operators of, uh, of activities and facilities. We have members of the public and we have media as our main stakeholders for communication. And the way we communicate with them has also changed and we try to keep up with, the modern, with all modern techniques and uh, scientifically proven methods. Uh, our communication to the governments and regulatory authorities is mainly through our safety standards, which are based on uh, scientifically, scientifically based information published by UNSCARE and summarized in recommendations of the ICRP. And based on that, we provide um, safety standards, which uh, national authorities and governments use to implement in their legislation. To support the regulatory bodies, operators, licenses and registrants, we also provide guidance on how to implement uh, safety standards. And related to radon, we have requirements in several parts of the basic safety standards related to protection against radon uh, for public and in workplaces. Uh, you can find them on our webpage. There's a set of uh, guidance available and other is are under the development. We have also technical documents, safety reports, uh, supporting the member states and their authorities, governments and operators to implement the requirements. The, another tool if, which we use for communicating with our member states are technical meetings where we discussed important issues related to radon. And one example is a recent meeting on implications of the new dose conversion factors for radon. Uh, the member states uh, are represented in the Radiation Safety Standards Committee. The, all information from the Radiation Safety Standards Committee is open to anyone on our webpage. You can download everything from agenda, presentations, and conclusions of each meeting. Uh, it's an open and transparent communication and decision-making process that we use to support our member states in Europe and across uh, the world. We have so-called tool uh, called technical cooperation projects. Countries may apply for a project to support implementation activities and for Radon. We have discovered that the, there are a lot of expertise among the member states on what is Radon and how to measure it. And the main challenge that our member states experience is how to communicate about Radon, how to remediate Radon, how to convince uh, the need of remediation and prevention. And we pay a lot of attention to it, organizing regional workshops, training courses, experts missions to many countries. And you can see some examples uh, on the screen for these events. Uh, as a result of such uh, communication training courses, uh, there was a project born called STEAM. Uh, the member states that participate in the sub-project uh, decided that we want to use one um, questionnaire, the same questionnaire about radon, to assess the knowledge of the population about uh, radon and use the results of this assessment to develop national strategy on how to communicate about radon to different stakeholders. 
So this is an interesting project which is currently being implemented. We also develop another tool uh, such as webinars. Uh, on Radon we have had 11 different webinars dedicated. One of them, as Doctor um, has mentioned, there's a need for doctors to be educated on radon. We had one specifically dedicated to what doctors need to know about radon, how they could communicate, and many different other aspects on radon. An important thing is that uh, sometimes we communicate uh, information of a technical character, for example, prevention and mitigation of radon and other times we communicate on how to communicate. And for that, of course, we use communication experts as radon technical experts, it's hard to put information properly. Uh, and another tool that we develop is training material. This is material consisting of six modules for self-study with explanatory notes and uh, PowerPoints. You can use them for your own uh, communication purposes, you can share it with educational establishments, etc. And uh, one last thing I would like to inform you about is an upcoming e-learning on communication of risks and on radiation in general that is being developed currently and we will soon start training um, in this so-called COMPASS tool on communication. You are also encouraged to download and share the short radon video that we produced last year and, and many of the organizations and national authorities shared it on their web page. Um, and that's briefly what do we do in regards to radon risk communication at the agency. Thank you. Thank you, Olga. So, oh, um, Jim, can you please unmute yourself? Thank you. So there are many activities and tools that are addressing radon communication and remediation. However, the efforts to communicate the risks of radon often remain ineffective. We would like to get a bit deeper into the state of the art knowledge on radon risk communication. And our next speaker therefore is Tanya Perko. Tanya, you have done a lot of research on radiological risk communication and risk perception. Can you tell us what the main pitfalls are and how we could solve them? Yes, uh, thank you, Clara. Uh, what is the most important uh, to know is that we have a legal requirements uh, for communication about the radon uh, in the European uh, Union member states. Uh, since uh, we got these new basic safety standards uh, requirements uh, that they were accepted in 2013, the European countries would need to transpose these uh, basic safety standards until uh, um, 2008 in February. And these European safety standards, they clearly request in Annex 12 that every member state, European member state, should have a strategy for communication to increase public awareness and inform local decision makers, employers and employees of the risks of radon, including in relation to smoking. Moreover, the new basic safety standards, they require also from member states that member states shall provide as appropriate for the involvement of stakeholders in decisions regarding the development and implementations of strategies for managing exposure situations. This requirement to put more attention to the, to the uh, uh, communication about radon uh, go really well in line with the World Health Organization guidelines as, as well as with uh, revised general safety requirements of the International Atomic Energy Agency, as Olga mentioned before. Even more, also drinking water directive uh, from cancer directive of Euratom also requires uh, 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 information on the radon. So what is the status of radon communication campaigns in European countries then? So unfortunately, some countries are still transposing the EU legislation at the national level. Most European countries are still preparing for implementation of uh, these aspects. Only a few countries have at this moment communication plan 
And mainly these communication plans uh, are designed on the gut feelings and by radon experts only. Health communication experts or social science uh, and humanities uh, scientists are barely engaged in this communication plan. However, we have a really uh, uh, great examples in European uh, member states. For instance, we noticed that uh, in last month, uh, 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 German government opened a research call on the radon communication. And we would really like to see more, more such kind of uh, 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 science-based communication strategies as probably it will be developed in Germany. Uh, radon communicators, they are faced with particular challenges uh, in this field. For instance, one of those challenges uh, relate to complexity and scientific terms that they have to uh, use in their communication. Uh, they are faced with the uh, issues, for instance, how to explain what is the reference level to the lay people, how to explain what is 200 or 500 becquerel per cubic meter, explain what are the additional risks of radon, uh, why to use a passive detectors, and how to make a good maps, which colors to use, what kind of borders to put or also to explain in which indoor air quality measurements radon is included and in which not. And also, for instance, how to deliver the message to home owners without scaring them, you know, create concern but not fear. Uh, in most countries, communication of results from measurements is also not prepared in advance. So the countries, they apply the, the uh, uh, radon me measurement strategies, but they don't think, okay, when we get the results, how we will communicate them. They think about these things only when it's too late. And then there are also other challenges due to the organization or due to the system. For instance, uh, radon uh, health risks are shared between the different organizations, between different authorities that they share responsibilities for health. For instance, nuclear safety authorities, uh, Ministry of Health and uh, 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 Ministry of Spatial Planning and so on. And in many countries, we see that those authorities, they don't use a coordinated approach and they don't put all resources to develop good risk communication about the radon. There is also, what we notice is also that there is disconnection between the risk assessment and risk mitigation in the communication. There is also low interest in, the, in, um, in participation of stakeholders at different radon related events and also collaboration between national and local levels in some countries uh, uh, is not developed as it should be for a good uh, uh, radon communication. Uh, moreover, different communication campaigns were conducted in past decades uh, with the goal to increase the radon awareness and increase uh, 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 fear appeal. And th this is not optimal. We know from the communication science that this creates gap between the awareness and the action. So even if you are aware about the radon, if people were aware about the radon, the research shows uh, that they still don't apply the protective actions that they are advised. Even if they have resources available from the countries, they don't take the resources uh, to uh, remediate their houses and to protect themselves from the radiological risks due to radon. So uh, this gap is really well known gap in the communication science, in social sciences, and we know that we can address it, but to, we can address it with the different uh, uh, approaches and we have to definitely uh, tackle the change in behavior not only the attitudes if you want to change the behavior you need to tackle different levels you need to not only tackle the individual but also interpersonal organizational community level and societal level all these they have to be integrated and to influence the already the to, to become from the unaware to the, to the behavior change, you need to go through different stages. For instance, first, uh, we have to make unaware people aware 
and this has been successfully done in many European countries. But then we have unaware and unengaged uh, that we have undecided about an action and then people when they decide to act, acting and maintenance. So here with the radon communication, we are somehow, we somehow got blocked on this, on this level. And for this, we need to have a recognition that behavioral change is needed, desirable. Uh, we need to have motivation to make a change. We need to help people that they will believe that change can occur and can be maintained. We need to stimulate the trigger skills to initiate this change and uh, perceived benefits of this, this, this change. So all these things, they have to be, uh, they have to be addressed with the risk communication about the radon. And unfortunately they have, we missed them now. We overlooked and not often communicated about the subjective norms, what the important others will do, descriptive norms were not communicated, you know, belief about what other people will do in their behavior, uh, perceptions of uh, efficacy regarded, the recommended, recommended responses were not uh, targeted, attitudes, past behavior, moral norms, self-efficacy, risk perception, protect, uh, protective efficiency of an action, and so on and so on. There is a lot of scientific background that risk communication about the radon should, should take into account. We're designing risk communication, but unfortunately it was often all this knowledge overlooked. So to change, to effectively change behavior, we need to take different levels. And a radon norm project, the, the, which will start, officially started uh, uh, 1st of September, so yesterday, and kickoff meeting is organized 9 and 10th of uh, December, will tackle all these levels. And we, moreover, it will use multidisciplinary and transdisciplinary approach. We will discuss dosimetry, uh, exposure situations, mitigation, uh, effects and risks, but also societal aspects. So the social scientists, most of them from the SHARE platform, will work together with, uh, uh, with the experts, uh, technical experts in the, radon, um, in the radon risks, and they will try to holistically approach to these challenges in risk communication and improve at the end also the practice and at the end reduce risks uh, for the lung cancer in Europe. Thank you. Thank you very much, Tanya. Our last speaker of today's webinar is Professor Heidi van der Bosch. She is a recognized expert in health communication. Based on her experience, Heidi will talk about lessons learned from health communication and give us some outlook on the future research that will be conducted in the context of the Radonon project. Please, Heidi. Okay. So uh, thank you again. Indeed, I will talk from uh, a broader health communication perspective. Uh, and I hope that this might perhaps also inspire future Radon communication. I will actually start from two very common problems when we are trying to develop evidence-based health communication. And the first problem actually is that it is often very difficult to actually reach the target audience because we are, of course, living in an age of information abundance. There are many channels, there are many messages. Uh, so it's really hard to stand out and to actually grab people's attention for a health message. And this is also because oftentimes people are actually not always motivated to get informed about health issues and sometimes they even actually try to uh, actively avoid it. So that is the first uh, problem. A second problem is that even when we reach audiences, our messages might not have the impact that we would like them to have. Um, and there might be different reasons for that. Uh, for instance, uh, it can be that our message is too complicated, uh, that uh, the audience doesn't understand the message, or it could be that the message is uh, actually not relevant for them. For instance, um, oftentimes we indeed think that if we just uh, share knowledge about a health issue, that that is enough and that 
people will act, but actually oftentimes people, people already know about the health issue. And it's something else that actually hinders them in, for instance, changing their uh, behaviors. Um, so these are some common problems. And here I would like to suggest that perhaps in some instances or for some audiences, it might be good to, um, for instance, use um, a health uh, narrative approach. Uh, because health narratives can help us to reach a broader audience and health narratives are also uh, believed to be quite persuasive. Um, so when we're talking about health narratives, we're talking actually about stories. Uh, so stories where we have different uh, characters uh, with whom we can identify, characters that uh, experience problems or conflicts and in the end of the story, you will see that there is some kind of a solution for a problem or there is a kind of resolution for a conflict. And health narratives can actually take many, many forms. Uh, you can see a few examples here. Uh, so here you see uh, the poster of a movie called Philadelphia. I think most of you know it. It's a very famous movie um, with Tom Hanks and Denzel Washington. It's about AIDS and HIV. And at that time, this was a very important health issue. And this movie, perhaps more than any traditional campaigns, actually succeeded in uh, creating awareness, creating knowledge, changing attitudes uh, of people about this health uh, topic. Um, on the right side, you will see uh, how health uh, promoters are also using story, stories themselves. For instance, you will see uh, health uh, websites that are using uh, stories from, uh, for instance, patients like cancer patients. And in this way, they can uh, support other cancer patients, but this might also include some information for people about how to protect themselves. For instance, uh, do I have to undergo some kind of cancer screening? And then you, below you will see health narratives as they are present in use. Uh, so uh, apart from just the facts about COVID-19 um, and all the scientific uh, materials, you will see also like here on the BBC news website that they will report stories, stories about people who had uh, COVID-19 um, or stories about people who are engaging in protective behaviors, who are uh, dealing with putting on masks, for instance. So these are all types of narratives about health and they are also believed to be uh, actually persuasive because stories uh, present a natural way of learning, an experiential way of learning. And there are several theories that uh, suggest that stories are uh, actually very persuasive, uh, like transportation theories that uh, actually, actually suggest that when we are confronted with a story, we are actually transported into another world. Uh, we actually uh, experience what is happening with the characters, and that is very persuading. Uh, and it can also mean that we are less involved in finding arguments against, for instance, um, uh, a health message. We are less involved in counter-arguing. Uh, other theories mention that uh, we can learn through stories because we have uh, models in them. So people who are uh, doing certain behaviors and you see the results of these behaviors, the positive or the negative outcome. So behavior that is being rewarded or behavior that actually is being punished or has negative outcomes. And here again, we can learn from this. We can see, well, indeed, if we do this, uh, it's likely that this will, for instance, benefit our health. So identification with characters is important. And as uh, Tanya just told us, people also go through several stage, stages from uh, being unaware to being aware, et cetera. Well, uh, it's also good in stories that you can actually see the different phases people go through. And I just included the picture here from a soap in, in Flanders, where there was a storyline about transgenders and uh, uh, there was also a story about uh, a person who would, uh, would like to do a sex reassignment surgery. 
and uh, this person's father was very much against it and then gradually on this father changed his mind and the attitudes and his behaviors also changed so that's also a strength of uh, stories here you can see then how we as communication scientists also look at how people process messages. So here you have some scales that we use in surveys to see, for instance, if people were transported in the storyline or if they identified with the characters because those uh, variables are supposed to be very important in explaining the effect that can be generated by a narrative. One of the last slides then is that um, you can also indeed uh, include health narratives in popular formats, like in uh, existing entertainment. I just mentioned the Flemish soap, Thuis. It's a very, very popular soap in our country. It's uh, broadcast by the uh, public broadcaster and it has a very large audience on a daily basis. And they integrate actually many types of health issues. So there was a storyline about transgender persons, but there was recently also a storyline about uh, train accidents, people tra crossing railway tracks and then getting an accident. That was actually a combination or a, a collaboration with uh, the responsible uh, people for, for rail tracks. And, and this is actually a good way of reaching people because you can reach a large audience, also a large audience of people who are not really that interested in just getting leaflets or, or brochures about, uh, about health uh, issues. Um, you also, uh, actually get the storyline in a very uh, popular format. And as I told you, stories are actually experiences. So it makes uh, some problems that might be very abstract at first sight, it, it, it makes them also very tangible for the audience. Uh, another very important aspect is that these types of formats also create a lot of buzz, communication buzz. So people not only talk about these issues then in their families, but they also start talking about this online, for instance, on Twitter. So this is again creating a lot of attention for a certain issue. And as I said, um, if people are not aware of a health issue, it's very important difficult to attract their attention. Well, this is actually a way of getting a message across, even for topics or health issues people are not really interested in because they don't know actually about, about the health problem. So in this way, you create awareness. And once people are aware of a certain health topic, it makes them also more interested in the other forms of communication. So it makes it more easy to, for instance, send them then to a website with a specific information on this health uh, topic. So uh, here's a, again a model just to show that it's indeed also communication science based, uh, this way of, of uh, yeah, trying to create uh, entertainment education. And, and this is then really the last slide. Uh, in the Radon Arm project, we will indeed try to test uh, communication um, perspectives. So how can we get the message across? What kind of techniques or, or what kind of methods can we use? For instance, the narrative approach, does it work? And for whom does it work? Or for in which circumstances does it work? And we will also test the effects. So we can test the effects uh, in a lab uh, situation. We can see whether people are interested. We can monitor their face expressions. We can also let them uh, fill in a survey. But we can also uh, do a test in the, in the field or we can monitor, for instance, what has been said about Radon uh, on Twitter or on other social networking sites. So yeah, I would like to end my presentation uh, here. Thank you, Heidi, also for this interesting outlook onto the future research. Uh, just one short remark for our panelists. If you answer a question in the chat area, please also select the option um, that all panelists and attendees can see the answers. Uh, with now, we would like to have a discussion with all our panelists. 
Um, we received many questions and we are starting with the first one. It's a general question for all of you. Um, many countries are facing major economic challenges due to the COVID-19 pandemic right now. So what is the future perspective of rate and risk communication? Do we have a volunteer? Well, may maybe yes. I could just say something. Um, yeah, so I can't read the future first. Um, but on the other hand, it tends to be, of course, that when you have a major event that is uh, capturing a lot of attention, you have a challenge to keep the momentum for other communication. So it, it's uh, something that, of course, any community uh, talking about specific risks needs to keep in mind uh, that you know it might pe people can't, don't focus on everything all the time so you you have to make an extra effort to keep to keep it in the in the loop otherwise it may get down people's um visibility and uh, concerns. Um, another aspect, uh, I don't know if there is any research starting on that, but for example, people have been spending a lot of time at home. Uh, so what is the impact of that? You know, all, Then there are some secondary effects in relation to COVID. So that's a separate uh, problem, but uh, that may have an impact actually on people's exposure and, and other aspects. And you need to also include that in the communication. Thank you. Tanya, yes. Uh, yeah. So as uh, Big said, we are living in a risk society. So uh, we have and we are exposed to enormously a lot of risks in the daily life. And of course, raid on so long that somebody doesn't get sick in your family due to the, on the on doesn't get uh, cancer on the lung, then uh, usually this risk is not the most. Uh, our priority. So yes, we are competing for the attention of the of the people. Uh, for the and we are we need to drive the attention to the radon and we need to take any every opportunity that people will be attentive to to the communication, but not enough. We know if you are attentive, it's still not enough. You need to understand the messages. You need to be well, I mean, everything needs to be really well targeted to the small societal groups. Uh, the, the messages needs to be developed to the to the this specific uh, group. They need to be understood. They need to be um, uh, stored in the long and I mean, short and long-term memory and recall back when people are dealing with the renovation of the houses, buying the houses and so on. But we need also full support of the, of the system. So not to target only the individual level, but also really the topest level, societal level. Thank you, Tanya. Um, the next question is, most of the investment in risk communication goes to paper version of communication materials, so like leaflets or brochures. The question is, is this still appropriate? If yes, to what extent? And if not, which channels could be used? Um, Frederick? I'm sorry, I don't want to capture all the all the attention in answering, but that's that's a kind of a well-known uh, issue in in risk communication. People actually, we we know that people don't tend to read a lot, um, especially if you have you know lengthy documents. Um, it works better to have a mix of communication, and people lack narratives. They like you know hearing stories about what is happening. That tends to capture much more attention than distributing leaflets. Um, leaflets can work in some cases, uh, you know, it depends. It's like uh, if you present a leaflet and you use that as support for a conversation, that works much better than if you just distribute it to people. But again, you have to think about if you go for a written communication, you know, what kind of format? Is it readable? Is it short? Is it to the point? There has been a, a lot of work, for example, at Carnegie Mellon University uh, on the so-called mental models, exploring mental models of people on how they view risks and benefits, what they expect, developing that together with experts so that the end format is something that speaks to people. And again, the end format could be partly written, 
partly you know films uh, other ways so you need a web of communications so uh, the bottom line is like just kind of a, a, lang a long leaflet prepared by experts without taking on board you know risk perception and, and, and other uh, key factors of audience um, is unlikely to make a big impact Thank you, Frederick. Uh, yes, Heidi, please. Yes, I think I would like to echo that. Um, if we are talking about communication, we often choose for a mix of uh, media because indeed every medium has its own uh, capacities and its own advantages and disadvantages. So uh, different media channels reach different audiences, but they also have their own modalities. So indeed, if you would like to transmit uh, knowledge, actually it's very good to have something written down because people can process the, that information on their own pace and they have that information readily uh, available. But indeed, if the goal of the communication is something else, like indeed, um, yeah, for instance, um, uh, uh, transferring skills, uh, it's actually better to show things. Uh, a video is better to show behaviors than just writing it down. Just imagine when you're trying to cook, just having a recipe is much uh, more difficult than seeing somebody cook on a, a cooking show or on a small YouTube uh, video. So it depends on really a lot of characteristics of the media and indeed you often need a mix because different media uh, reach different audiences and have their own modalities and own strengths and weaknesses. Thank you, Heidi. Yes, Tanya. Uh, what, what we found out, in addition to everything what uh, has been said by Frederick and Heidi, I would like to point out that what we found out in our uh, communication research that the communication material in most of the countries has not been tested and the uh, uh, effectiveness of the communication material has also not been evaluated. So accordingly to this, also the communication material has not been improved. So, so this is uh, mostly the experts, they write down and they use in the leaflets or, uh, and they, or the, the pamphlets or the posters or whatever, they write down what they think that it would need to be communicated, but not uh, they don't base this uh, uh, this information on the uh, on the evidence. Is what people need to know and how they perceive this, how they understand these things. So I would appeal, I think, in the name of all uh, risk communicators, experts, please before you develop uh, some communication tools, communication materials, do a research what kind of communication tools and materials uh, your target population uh, use, how they uh, test this communication material, improve it, and then follow the effectiveness of this communication material. So it's a full process that should be applied and not only that we communicate however we feel that it's the best. Thank you, Tanya. Uh, I would like to continue with the next question. Um, it is, what do you think we should do to achieve a negligible level of agreement facing of cultural differences? Um, who wants to address this question? Yes, Frederick. <laughs> Sorry, I was jumping. Uh, I'm not entirely sure I understand the the question, so sorry if I if I misunderstood the question. But but I wanted to just uh, highlight, you know, cultural differences. That's a concept that's a bit problematic because it's a bit fuzzy, and we use it a lot informally. But then when we move to the science, it's it's more complex. But what is, however, very important is to indeed pay attention to the specific sensitivities and perceptions in specific context in cultural context if you want to, to define it that way. Uh, clearly, you know, Raiden may be seen differently, um, you know, um, in, in, a, in a context where there has been a lot of discussion about it, where there is some proactive communication in uh, compared to an, an, another context where, you know, it's a new issue and people just discover it and they say, oh, so that means, as, as uh, Laura explained, and that was uh, fascinating, you know, like, oh, should I move? 
move? Uh, is there a problem here? Uh, so uh, that, that will create some different environments. Also tied to that, whether you have high level of trust, low level of trust to whoever gives you the information. And that again varies from country to country or even from you know, area to area. Uh, if you know, uh, typically you know, Swedish health authorities have a history of being highly trusted. They speak to the population, population say, oh yeah, okay, that's something we have to take on board. In other countries, for various reasons, health authorities have been discredited by, for other things that have nothing to do with Raiden. But if they jump in and they say, we have advice to give you on Raiden, maybe people will be skeptical. What are they talking about? Relationship to uh, discussion about radioactivity in countries, you know, that could ring a bell and in other countries less so. So anyway, in a nutshell, you know, these context aspects tied to the cultures of different countries and places are very important. They need to be integrated into communication. Thank you, Frederick. Um, yes, Tanya. Uh, I would uh, like to drive attention also to the questionnaires that we are uh, um, applying now in different countries. For instance, Olga mentioned that they have a really interesting STEAM project where, where they will apply exactly the same questionnaire in uh, uh, many member states of EIA. Uh, also in Radonorm, uh, we are going to, we are developing now the questionnaire that will measure all latent constructs uh, uh, potentially influencing the effectiveness of the risk communication for the radon uh, uh, in different European countries, in 11 European countries. Uh, however, also here we have to be really attentive to cultural differences already in the, on the in the research field when we do assessment of the of the situation in the field for instance in belgium there's no way that you ask people uh, what is your income family income it it doesn't go it's it's not culturally accepted well in some other countries you can ask this but you cannot ask for instance uh, 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 some different lifestyles where you can ask that this in belgium so this cultural difference differences are in all, uh, I mean, we are all social scientists and also humanities. They are the basis of the, of the things that whatever we do, all of the research, all uh, science that we do, and also then a practical application of the risk communication. Cultural differences, they have to be taken into account on every stage of developing of risk communication, from the research to the, to the application. And not only cultural differences, but even differences from region to re region, local, local differences. So, Yes, they should be studied and taken into account, always. Thank you, Tanya. Um, the next question is directed to Frederick. Do you have any statistically significant evidence that the word pollutant is less scary to the general public compared to the word radioactive? Yes. Hi. So, so this is a very good question. Thanks, Olga, for asking. Um, what we have in terms of statistics, um, we have actually a lot of studies that came from Paul Slovich and Baruch Fischoff that rate different type of exposures and different types of risk in people's perceptions. That's more what we have in, in quantified terms. And this consistently places uh, radioactivity at the most feared end of the spectrum. Uh, the so-called dread factor. So people don't like, uh, you know, radioactivity. Now, pollutants is more of a fuzzy concept, obviously, because it can, you know, be you can be get pollution from different sources. Some more scary, some less scary. But actually, precisely in framing communication this way, I think we we move to precisely being less absolute about it, as opposed to its radioactivity. And the second aspect that I wanted really to stress is moving slightly away from your question, but I think it's tied to it in a way, is when we discuss these issues, we need, and that's the thing that came also in some other answers, but it comes with the mitigation. Risk communication is not just about the dread, the bad, it's also about what can you do about it? And in this particular field, framing it as pollutant help you 
to say, okay, we have some pollution, we can deal with that pollution. And actually, for that kind of indoor pollution, we have solutions that can really drastically diminish the risk that you have. And that's a very different way of communicating as opposed to focusing on the radioactivity, because then you focus on the negatives and you're like, yeah, it's highly radioactive. So, and we have to measure it, by the way, and maybe you're in the bad category. And then that you kind of prompt a more negative uh, view of what you know what is the problem and what can be done about it. Yeah, so that would be my answer. Could I could I make a comment um, on on this? <clears throat> Something that I don't like for many many years is the emphasis on radon being a natural radioactivity. It is. It's correct. It is natural. Whereas indoor radon, whether it's at your workplace or in your home, is artificial. It's crea created as a result of human activity of building buildings in bad ways, etc. So I think we should gradually phase out the emphasis on the natural side of radon. It's natural, it's been there always. Whereas building technology is quite capable nowadays of making buildings which are effectively radon proof. So if you have a high radon level, it's a problem, an anthropogenic problem. It's created by the building technology. Yeah. Yeah, I, I would like just to follow up very quickly. I don't want to kind of be the only one speaking, but uh, I think it's a very important point that you're making because, and I suspect it comes from the fact that we know from perception studies that things that are perceived as natural tend to be less feared, that things that are perceived, risks that are perceived, hazards that are perceived as, uh, you know, um, uh, technological. But uh, I totally agree with you because it's not because you were reinforced saying, telling people it's all natural, don't worry, it's all natural that they, they they will perceive it that way. And as you say, it's actually even misrepresenting in this case, the, the, the actual situation. Mm -hmm. But you know, people have tried that with chemicals. Oh, but you find the same compound in nature, so it's natural, don't worry. But it doesn't work like that uh, in people's perception. You, can, you cannot assume, you cannot change their perception. So you have to work from their perception. And so I think you need to represent the situation as it is. And so I, I, I totally agree with you for that reason. Yes, Tanya. Uh, uh, James, you pointed out an extremely important uh, question, which should be also scientifically proven. So we, our, also our gut feelings, our expert feelings, they say, yeah, when we mention the word natural, uh, this becomes more tolerated, more accepted. We know this from the similar research, not concretely from the, from the radon. Uh, but now in the new uh, radonone project, we are uh, going to apply the research. We, we, we are going to test how, what is the effect of different framing of the radon. In one uh, uh, experimental groups, we are going to frame it as a naturally, uh, naturally radioactive gas. In the other experimental group, we will uh, frame it as this indoor air pollutant and we will see what kind of latent constructs will be influenced by different framing. So uh, we, will do, we will do this research, but up till now, the research in the risk communication and risk perception shows if we mention the word natural, it's accepted, it's tolerated. If we use the word radioactive, it's not. So the combination of these two is still some, a, a little bit questionable for us, but we need more research to prove uh, how exactly uh, they influence our perception of uh, or information uh, processing. Yeah, I, I, I think Thank we you. should drop as much as possible the emphasis on natural and just say it's an indoor pollutant caused by the construction of your house and the geology underneath your house. Just treat it as a part of indoor air quality. <laughs> Play down the natural actually. I mean, strictly speaking, there's nothing unnatural about artificial radioactivity either. It's all part of nature uh, of a form. So uh, the, just, just the point is that I think people, when they hear it's a natural radioactivity, they say, oh, it doesn't come from the nuclear power station. But really, I don't think that's a good argument anymore. Just treat it as an indoor uh, air pollutant caused by the construction of your building and that you can fix, okay? Okay, thank you. Uh, I would like to continue as we are running out of time. Uh, we got a general comment, which I would like to read. Radon risk communication is one thing, 
but it is then necessary to be able to provide tools for measurements and methods for radon diagnostic and remediation. Communicating on radon risk is efficient and will not create fear if it is associated with communication and how you can protect yourself. And nowadays, the main issue for radon management is really the ability to provide information on where to find the relevant radon expert and to have building professionals trained and educated on radon remediation techniques. Um, does someone want to add on this, on this general comment? Yes, Tanya, please. Yes, on the most things I agree. Uh, I think that one of the greatest experts wrote this comment from France. I think that this was Caroline. <laughs> uh, I would like to share the information that uh, a lot of nuclear safety authorities and also European Radon Association, they publish on their internet pages where the experts can be found and which experts uh, for remediation of the houses, they have a license uh, to remediate your house if the elevated measures of the radon have been uh, found. So the, the information is possible to find. However, yes, um, that we come to this stage, it's also quite a lot of work needs to be done. But Olga can also give some more information on, the, on this. Yeah, thank you. Uh, well, yes, of course, it goes without saying, but what we communicate is exactly what you say, that radon is a health issue and there's a way to measure it and mitigate it. That's the main content of our communication to general public. But also we should keep in mind that we don't communicate only to the members of the public. We communicate with our um, peers in other authorities we communicate and they have we have to convince them to take responsibilities from their side of regulatory or legislative part uh, we communicate to local authorities we to educate them on how to talk to general public because usually local authorities are closer to the population and the these authorities are the ones where the general public turn in the first place. We communicate to uh, educational establishments, we communicate to academics, and they communicate in their turns. So communicating is not only to general public, that's really important to keep in mind. We communicate to Ministry of Finances to, to provide subsidies, to provide annual budget for aid on programs. So many different communication channels and needs. And of course, building our communication strategy and the, the content of communication depends to whom I want to communicate and what I want them to do, whether I want a member of the public to measure and mitigate or I want the Ministry of Finance to provide subsidies. Thank you very much. Um, as we are running short in time, I would like to come to our last question. Um, it is actually about the uh, next RICOMET event, which is this afternoon. It is a consultation to investigate the potential of citizen science for effective radon measurement and mitigation. So now I'm asking you as communication experts, do you think that citizen science has some potential for radon measurement or mitigation? Please just briefly answer this question. Uh, we can start with Laura, please. I, I totally agree that this is an, a, a really good option and we need to engage the citizen and in our case, for example, in oncology, the patients are really active. Well, they are already patients, but these are, um, they are really active in social media. They're promoting right now research, specific research with them. So I believe that the citizen will do the same thing. I need to know because I guess in, in France, in Spain, where I've been working, I have the impression that the people are not um, informed about radon. So probably if they are actively informed and uh, it can be involved in research, it would be a good point to develop. Uh... Thank you, Laura. Uh, Frederic, please. 
Yeah, so um, in my case, the concept of citizen science, I'm fine with it as long as science stays there. Um, if it's just uh, unfocused and uh, you know, opening a can of worms, as we see sometimes with unfocused discussions where the science get lost and we, we want at all costs to generate a consensus, then I have problems with it. Uh, that said, um, I think it's very important to link, you know, uh, in, in, in risk communication, that's one basic basic and you know Baruch Fischoff saying you know make people partners as one of the kind of key steps of higher steps of risk communication back in 95 so not in such recent uh, paper so it's very important to 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 engage and uh, you know I, I it's worrying if as it just was just said by Laura you know in some countries in Europe you know citizens are just at the end being the end of the pipeline top-down information they don't know where it's coming from etc and you so you need to work through organizations as well that can you know integrate with the science but but again I I like the idea that I like to reinforce the fact that I want science to be part of that I don't want it to be just you know free for all kind of discussions where all sorts of uh, you know, theories um, emerge and without being checked and challenged, then I have a problem when it goes that way. And we have seen in other sectors that it can be the case. Thank you. Um, Olga, please. I think the citizen science should be, um, of course, in any society should be. And the two ways of using this uh, phenomena is one that the scientists look around themselves and find good ideas among the citizens. And sometimes every, um, at the first point, crazy idea might turn into a good scientific tool, whether it's a communication tool or measurement tool or remediation tool or whichever tool or a spaceship. Uh, on the other side, we can use uh, citizens in our scientific research and involve them actively, that's the other way to use it. So it could be in both directions and both directions are equally important. Thank you, Olga. Um, Tanya, please just a short uh, comment. Yes, uh, thank you. Uh, we can see uh, that there are emerging citizen science initiatives in all corners of the world and in all domains. We can uh, see them from the citizens measuring or contributing to the to the air quality measurements. Back to the Fukushima where citizens contribute to the with the scientific results and measurements uh, in the remediation processes after the nuclear emergency. So why not? I'm looking forward to this, uh, to follow this discussion this afternoon and to explore potential also not only for the measurements, but also for mitigation. And this is the challenging, how citizens can contribute to mitigation. Thank you, Tanya. Uh, and Heidi, please. Uh, you have to unmute your phone, please. I'm sorry, I always forget about that. Yes, I agree with all my colleagues uh, here. So indeed, it's a, it's a good way or it can be a good way to actually involve uh, people. Uh, we have some uh, nice examples here in Flanders too, indeed, about measuring uh, air pollution. And these uh, initiatives were actually very successful, created a lot of awareness and people were really involved in it. Too. So it, it, it is possible, but indeed uh, it depends on how the initiative eventually then looks it shouldn't also be just a one shot uh, thing uh, and i agree with what uh, frederick um, mentioned before that uh, you can do a lot of campaigns but it's important to continue also the communication so to do it on a regular base thank you very much so i think we are all looking forward to this consultation in the afternoon um, but now I would like to invite the ERA representative James McLaughlin to give some closing remarks. Please, Jim. Okay, thank you. Thank you very much. <clears throat> it's been a fascinating webinar uh, with a lot of new ideas coming up. In particular, um, if I could summarize it like this, as I see it, um, there were three presentations uh, from Frederick, Olga, and Tanya, which essentially were dealing with different aspects of we'll call them 
the communications problems that we're aware of, uh, which I'll come back to in a moment. And then there were two presentations from Laura and Heidi, which touched on an area that we've neglected quite a lot, which is the involvement of people with expertise in the health area, like the medical doctors and people developing health narratives. I think these are very important for us to hear. I'm a physical scientist, I'm a, a physicist, and uh, a lot of people this morning are uh, speaking from a social science perspective. But from the physical point of view is one of the things we are lacking up to now, uh, speaking in terms of errors activities, the European Radon Association, is involvement with the medical profession. And I think what Laura highlighted this morning uh, in a fascinating subject of dealing directly with patients with lung cancer, that's an area that we welcome more contact with. And it's good to have someone like Laura, who effectively is an advocate, an advocate for um, medical recognition of radon as a problem, because the, we've had problems uh, getting in contact with the medical profession uh, at, a, at a, a professional level. Uh, look, you, you get the usual message, it's lung cancer is caused by smoking. Don't mess things up by uh, pointing out this minority contribution, which is, isn't that small from radon. So anyway, I, I think the uh, experience of listening to Laura this morning has been very, very stimulating. And it's great to hear that there's actually a movement towards educating the medical profession on the radon problem. Heretofore, that hasn't been a big, a big thing going on. So I welcome that. And the other health, the other health area that was touched on, as I said, was by Heidi talking about uh, explaining the communication story on radon through the medium of health narratives and even education, entertainment education. This is an area that I think could be developed. Now, with respect to the other contributions, we touched, they touched on a lot of aspects, such as the fact that a lot of money has been wasted where the communications um, campaigns have not been properly designed or science-based. And uh, this is true, and we want to improve that. Um, Tanya was touching on the idea, not touching on the idea, but developing that really we have to change people's behavior, however we do it. It's very, very difficult um, because apathy is a big problem, which how do you overcome apathy uh, dealing with the public? They say, oh yeah, uh, radon is interesting, but I'm not going to do anything about it. I mean, for instance, in my own country, Ireland, I think it's correct that even people who are told they have a very high radon level, only a tiny fraction, maybe a quarter or less of them will do anything. Even if they're offered help, they won't do it. So we have a big difficulty there. Um, Olga gave us a good account of the uh, huge resources available, uh, very, very useful resources available from the IAEA through training programs, etc. And um, the guidelines they have and the documentation and uh, various uh, informations that have been developed over the years by IAEA. And I would say people should tap into that. Um, in my own case, speaking on behalf of ERA, we on our website, uh, anyone who has a problem with the technical aspects of either measuring radon, uh, how to deal with the problem, we are a resource that would be quite happy to help. Okay? Uh, one thing finally that has been always bothering me every time we speak about radon risk, etc. How do we actually express the risk? Some people express the risk, you're above a reference level, but that's not a statement of risk. That's just a statement of you're above a level or below a level. So um, the terms we in the physical sciences use like uh, Becquerel's per cubic meter, dose in millisieverts, it means absolutely nothing to the public. So we have a big challenge there to express the risk to people, try and compare it, for example, with road traffic deaths or something else that they're used to. And uh, that's an area that doesn't feature quite a lot up to now in communications uh, programs or campaigns. So that's just a personal view. I see we're running out of time. I could keep going on, but I won't. 
um, except to say it's been a fascinating experience and I think we should thank the organizers of this. It's been a big job doing it. This meeting was actually meant to be a real live meeting in, in uh, Athens this week and it's been postponed and hopefully next year the plan is to have a version, a further version of this in, in Athens, I understand. And I think uh, great credit is, is to be given to people like Tanya Perko and Vasiliki Tafili in, in the Greek uh, Atomic Energy Commission, as well as the Share Secretary and the Rickham Met Secretariat. Um, I can't pronounce the name very well, Meritexel uh, Martel and Sonia, of course, Sonia Roots. There are people like that in the background who have been doing a huge amount of work. Uh, I congratulate them on a job well done under the difficult situation of COVID. Thank you. Okay. Thank you, Jim. Uh, with this, I would like to close today's webinar. I would like to thank our speakers for their insights and contributions they provided, and also thank all attendees for taking the time being here and asking those really interesting questions. We had more than 100 participants from all around the world. Thank you for joining this webinar. I wish you all the best and see you next time. Bye.